Welcome to World History 3 and what we'll do is we'll start off our class by looking at state building in particular uh, what happens in France. We'll start off the class by looking at a few uh, definitions and one of course is state building and by state building what I mean is so the process of what happens when a government is formed and how it's formed and why it's formed. Um, we'll see that there's a couple different types, um, especially uh, absolutism and constitutional monarchy, which I'll talk about in a bit. But with absolutism, um, easy to remember, it's absolute rule by a monarch, meaning the, the, the ruler does everything absolutely, makes all the decisions, and so on. And what I've done in the rest of this slide is given you um, a few of the countries we are going to look at. In this lecture in particular, we're going to look at France. We're not really going to look at Russia. And then we'll look at constitutional monarchy, um, in particular in England, and this is something we'll look at in, in Lecture 2. And just a few more definitions before we get started. So the first one that I want to look at is something called natural law. And this had a really big impact on the way that governments were forming in Europe in particular in the 1500s and 1600s. Now, there's a lot of roots to natural law, but mostly what I want you to remember is that they're immutable. Uh, at least it was believed there be they would be immutable, meaning unchangeable. Um, to be a natural law, it has to be rational. So people should be able to think about it and understand it by human reason. And this will come into play more when we talk about constitutional monarchy. The other idea that really played a big impact on the formation of governments in Europe, especially absolutism, was the divine right of kings. And we'll talk about the roots in just a bit. But divine right of kings just really means that um, God or gods gave these kings or queens the right to rule. And I just put up here autocracy. We're not really going to talk about it very much, but if you're looking through the secondary sources, autocracy just really means uh, rule of one person or a single ruler. Grotius was really the founder of the idea that natural laws should be something that governments should be using. So again, they're immutable and rational, and uh, which means you have the capability of understanding it. Mostly what I want to do uh, for this slide is look at two people in particular, uh, John, or Thomas Hobbes and Rousseau. Now, first of all, I want to just introduce you a little bit to Thomas Hobbes. If you've taken a philosophy class, you probably have, have heard of him. Um, he believed, as I put up here on the slide, that there are two impulses that really drive people to do things. One is the fear of death, so everyone is afraid of dying, at least according to Hobbes. And one is the desire for power. Now, here we're talking about political power. So Hobbes designed an idea called the social contract. And his belief is that a group of people got together and gave away their their power to one single person and this person in return said that he would protect these people so in effect what you're getting is um, these two impulses being controlled so people have a fear of death so if they're protected they should be okay and you've got all these people who have desire for power now you give that power to one person so again the social contract is that a group of people give one person power, and that person promises to protect them. You also have um, Rousseau. Now, he also believed in the social contract, but unlike Hobbes, who believed the social contract couldn't be changed, Rousseau believed that it could be. So if a group of people gave power to somebody, and for whatever reason that person was a bad ruler, Rousseau says that you can change, change this government. Now let's look at the idea of the di divine right of kings. And I'd mentioned this before, it's uh, pretty easy to remember. It just means that um, God gave the right to a king or queen to rule. And of course, what this means is um, you can't really go against the word of the king because you're going against the word of, of God. And of course, this will lead to absolutism. One of the earliest divisors of this idea was St. Augustine. And I've given you the dates here on this slide. He wrote a, a fairly massive book called City of God. And what he did was he tried to think about why you've got rulers on the planet who aren't necessarily Christian. And if they're not Christian, for him, they're not that really good rulers. But God put them there. So 
divine right of kings is that God put them there and then people should listen to their rulers. And I'll talk about Bousseau uh, once we uh, get a little further into the lecture because Bousseau had a really big impact on Louis XIV in terms of his moving France to absolutism. So far we've been talking about these political theories like absolutism and the divine right of kings, but you also have wars that really played a big impact on the way that governments were formed during this period. And probably one of the most important ones that had a very large impact on Europe was called the Thirty Year War, and I give you the dates here on the slide. This was one large war, and it was really starting in the Habsburg dynasty or um, in Germany and Austria. Um, during this period, you've got an emperor named Ferdinand II, and he was a very strict Catholic, and he didn't like anybody in his kingdom who was not a Catholic. And there were plenty of Protestants, and what they decided to do is to resist Ferdinand II. Now, what ended up happening is that Ferdinand II made a law and said that all the Protestant churches in his area need to be closed. Now, of course, the Protestants certainly didn't like this, and this leads to an episode called the Defenestration of Prague, which I have on the next slide. The Defenestration of Prague. Now, defenestration means to be thrown out a window. And so what happened is Ferdinand II sent some Catholic representatives to Bohemia. Now, you might have to back the video up to look at the map again. Um, so he sent them to Bohemia and told the Protestants that they had to shut down their churches. So, of course, the Protestants didn't like this, and as you can see from this woodcut, what they ended up doing is tossing the Catholic um, representatives out a window, which is defenestration. Of course, this happened in 1617. Now, there are sort of two versions of this. The Catholic representatives actually survived, and according to the Catholics, the angels came down and lifted them or carried them to the ground safely. Now, the Protestants have another version of this, and I'm going to use some language here. I hope it doesn't offend anybody. But for lack of a better word, the Protestants said that the Catholics survived because they fell into a pile of shit. The defenestration of Prague really started this 30-year war. And there's a lot of things that are happening all at the same time. And, and remember just to read your book about this particular period. Um, but you've got the war happening from 16, starting in 1617. And in 1627, you have something called a Bohemian Diet. And here a diet means a conference. And it's at this conference when you have the Habsburg kings becoming hereditary. Before they were chosen, um, now they're made hereditary. And this was to solidify the power. You also have some other countries getting involved in this particular period. Um, and what I should have done in this slide is put a little chart up, but you've got Spain, Austria, and Prussia fighting on one side, and Denmark, Sweden, and France on the other. And Spain gets involved in this war, and they get involved primarily to fight in the Palatine state. Now, this is some territory that they really wanted. So you've got Spain involved in this war. Now, on the other hand, Sweden gets involved. Um, they were primarily worried that the Catholics would get involved in... And of course, Sweden didn't like this. Now, it's at this point when um, Austria decided that it was just having a really hard time with this war, and it decided to give toleration to the Protestants. So it's at this point when the toleration was given that France gets involved in the war. And at this point, uh, the King of France was Louis XIII, and his chief advisor was a man named uh, Cardinal Richelieu. I'll talk about Richelieu in just the next slide. But this war was pretty serious, and most of the fighting took place on German soil, so it was pretty devastating for Germany and Austria. And if you look at sort of economic numbers, the whole economy of Europe ended up going down during this time. Uh, millions of people ended up dying, cities were sacked, and disease was spread, and it was a pretty awful time. Now, you finally get the end of the war in 1648, which is called the Peace of Westphalia. And what this did was, at least in Germany and Austria, it allowed the German states, so there were quite a few German states during this period, it allowed the German states to pick and choose what religion they wanted to. So you could have one state becoming Catholic and another state becoming Protestant. 
And what you tend to see at the, the end of the Thirty Year War is this division between Northern Europe and Southern Europe, where most of Northern Europe becomes Protestant and most of Southern Europe becomes Catholic. And this division um, still continues today. You also have some other countries being formed during this time. And this is the Swiss Confederation and the Dutch Republic. Now they were both made independent on, um, with the condition that they could not pick sides in uh, future wars. You also have some really interesting things happening in Germany. So remember I just mentioned you've got a bunch of German states. These German states were given their independence. And I said they could choose their own religion, but they were essentially given um, powers to do what they wanted to and almost became independent states. This is a big reason why you don't get modern Germany forming it until 1871 or 1872. So it takes a long time for these states to give up their power. Um, the outcome of this 30-year war, France becomes the most powerful country in Europe at this period. Now, not everyone is happy. You can see from the slide, you've got peasant revolts happening throughout Europe. And this is mostly peasants rising up against some of these power structures that are being developed because of the 30-year war. Now, what I wanna do for the rest of the lecture is focus on France. So we'll start with looking at um, a king named Louis XIII, and I've given you his dates here. Now, as you might have guessed, he was a strict Catholic, and he became king fairly young, and his mother um, put a cardinal really in charge of his education, and this cardinal was named Cardinal Richelieu. And um, Cardinal Richelieu ended up running France for quite a while while Louis XIII was growing up. Now, Louis XIII didn't like Protestants, and he ended up passing a whole bunch of laws against the Protestants. Um, in particular, they couldn't be part of the government and they couldn't be part of the military. But he did, in one sense, preserve their religious rights. So they could be Protestant, but it just wasn't a, a happy mix. Now, Richelieu was very interested in controlling the Protestants and he had uh, King Louis XIII pass a number of laws that made it really difficult for these people to not only practice their religion, but to even own their property. And so in the next slide, what I'm going to show you is something called the Edict of 1624. And what I want you to do is to stop the video and go to the tag and actually read some of this edict. And I see that I misspoke. Um, it is actually the Edict of 1626. Anyway, what I want you to do is stop the video, click on the tag, and then read part of this edict. Um, I've given you some of it here. It essentially is talking about getting rid of some castles, and you're not going to be surprised that most of the castles that were destroyed during this period belong to the Protestants. The next king I want to talk about is probably one of the more famous French kings, and that's Louis XIV. Um, also known as the Sun King because the Sun provides life for everything and that's how he saw himself. Now I just talked about uh, Richelieu. So Richelieu ends up dying and then uh, Louis XIV's father dies in 1643 and Louis XIV becomes king when he is five years old. Now, obviously that's too little to rule so what his mother did is appointed another cardinal and this is Cardinal Mazarin. He has some really interesting history. Um, he certainly believed in the divine right of kings, and that's what he taught Louis XIV the whole time that he was growing up. Um, I, in the next slide, what I want to do is talk a little bit about what Mazarin did to organize Louis XIV's government before Louis XIV came of age. Mazarin, as you might imagine, was a Catholic along with Louis XIV. And he spent quite a bit of money um, preventing the Protestants from doing quite a few things in France. Another thing he spent quite a bit of money on was to um, attack the Habsburgs, who of course were living in Austria. And the French and the Austrians were deadly enemies through a good part of um, the history that we're going to talk about during, during this class. Um, one of the fights that Mazarin had with the Protestants in particular I mean, in particular in the city of France, is something called the fronde. And as I put up here on the slide, it means the sling. What happened here is that uh, the Parisians were unhappy in general, and they were fighting against their government and fighting against poverty in general. And Mazarin sent in the troops. 
and the people got together and used slingshots to sort of push the troops out. And what we find is that many of the troops during this period crossed over to uh, the civilian side. So it wasn't necessarily a good, um, a good fight for Mazarin. Now, I already mentioned um, the Edict of 1626, which limited castles. You've got Mazarin doing the same thing. He did not like uh, the nobility, especially the power that they were trying to take away from the king. So Mazarin was the power behind the throne. Now, Louis XIV took power in 1661, and he really did take absolute control of the French government. He got rid of the prime minister. Um, he did things like uh, stamp passports. So he was totally in control of what was happening throughout his rule. And I've mentioned Bousseau before. Uh, Bousseau was an advisor to King Louis XIV, and he wrote on the duties of the kings, and what he did essentially is push this idea of absolutism on Louis XIV and said that God put Louis XIV um, to rule over France, and if you go against the, the rule of Louis XIV, you're really going against God. So he's a really good example of uh, the development of government during this period, especially in terms of absolutism. One of the more famous things that Louis XIV is famous for is his palace of Versailles, which is about 12 miles outside of Paris. And this was originally a hunting lodge for, uh, lodge for his father, Louis XIII, and he greatly expanded that. Um, what I'll do is I'll put a tag here showing you the plans of Versailles. And what you can see is that uh, Louis XIV had his apartments in the center and all um, the op governmental offices and all the nobility ended up living there and they lived in the wings of Versailles. So Louis XIV put himself at the center of this massive palace. Louis XIV also got involved in some wars with his European uh, counterparts. And one in particular was called the Dutch War, 1672 to 1678. Now, Louis XIV hated the Dutch. Um, the Dutch were extremely successful in terms of marketing. And what they started to do is flood the French market with goods. So Louis XIV decided to declare war on them. Um, this war was not totally successful because what the Dutch ended up doing is flooding a lot of their um, uh, countryside by breaking some of their dikes, which of course prevented the French troops from fighting within uh, the Dutch cities. So what Louis XIV ended up doing is hiring a man named Colbert. And in, um, in a few lectures, I'll talk di um, distinctly or directly about uh, mercantilism, which is an economic theory based on having colonies, essentially. Um, uh, a couple parts of mercantilism, and again, I'll talk about this more in detail later, is that um, the idea is that you need to have a lot of gold and silver in your treasury, you need to have colonies. Um, to protect those colonies, you have to have a strong navy. To have a strong economy as well, you need to have um, it based on agriculture, which is fairly common during this period. Another part of mercantilism, which I'll go into more detail later, is that countries needs, needs to export more than it imports. And again, I'll talk more about this in a bit, but Colbert um, brought mercantilism to France, and it was fairly successful in terms of an economic theory, and as we'll see, many other countries um, do this. Now, part of mercantilism is starting colonies. So you have colonies um, starting in Canada with that were fairly successful for the French until the war um, wars that happened in the 1700s, which we'll talk about. Now, Louis XIV also occasionally did not go to war for various reasons. Uh, we know that the Muslims reached Vienna, Austria in 1683, and even though a lot of Europe was worried about this, Louis XIV decided to hold back, so he didn't come to the aid of the Austrians. Now, the Austrians pushed the Muslims out, and then you've got Louis XIV declaring war on the Austrians because they were at a weak point. You also have another war that I'm not really going to talk about here, but if you want to look up some more information, you certainly uh, can do that. It's the War of the League of Augsburg, um, which involved a large part of Europe. And what I'll do is I'll put a tag up in case you're interested in reading about the War of the League of Augsburg and the war that happened 
The final slide I have here on uh, French history and the development of the government is something called the War of Spanish, Spanish Succession. And what was happening here is that um, a grandson of Louis XIV was chosen to be king of Spain, and the Austrians who claimed uh, the throne of Spain did not like this. Uh, they ended up <clears throat> going to war, and in the end, um, what it was decided is that the grandson of Louis XIV could become king of Spain, but Spain and France could not become a single country. So that was the deal. And what they're trying to do is prevent France from becoming this massive powerhouse. And you start to see this balance of power between different governments during this period. Now, to make the Habsburgs uh, or the Austrians happy, they received the ne Netherlands and a good chunk of northern Italy. So that was to make them happy with the idea that this again would keep the balance of power.